Uh, good afternoon. The title is a little bit uh, loose, but what we're really talking about today, what I want to talk about is basically humans as a single point of failure in DR and PCP planning. Um, so the Aussie man just reference come back around, but InfoRex set Rockstar's thing is basically about irreplaceable people. So we'll get back to that real quick. Just about me. Um, got a couple certifications listed up there. Uh, the GCED is always fun because you like a certification title, Enterprise Defender. This sounds really cool. Um, but that's my SANS one. Um, I am the Information Security Architect for United Community Banks. All thoughts and opinions are mine. I don't have that on the slides anywhere, but it uh, has to be mentioned. So um, I've got my Twitter handle up there. I usually use that to kind of follow the community, not put a whole lot of stuff out. I'll try to get better about that. I know it's one thing you always want to contribute, which is the reason up here. So I've got about 17 years in tech, InfoSec, or some blend of the two. Um, kind of came up organically, uh, helped us all the way up um, through engineering, through training, working with uh, mostly supporting financial institutions or consultants working in with financial institutions. So um, a few of my favorite things, like I said, I just want to mention a couple things. I'm a bit of a documentation freak. I enjoy doing documentation. I enjoy well-maintained documentation. It's helped me in my life. I know that's not a very fun thing, but this talk doesn't cover a lot of fun things, but it's good stuff and it's stuff we want to talk about. The other thing is about me, I like regulatory guidance. God bless everybody that works in unregulated uh, shops. Um, having that backing to be able to take the management when I have a security control I want to implement, so I don't have to argue it on my own, but say, this is a good idea, we need to do this, but these guys might shut us down if we don't. It's always been helpful. Uh, working without that crutch changes things quite a bit. So. Um, about this talk, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants was a thing. So when I thought about first submitting this talk, uh, it was just after me besides Chattanooga, heard several good things. Um, so maybe I've got something to say. And then I jumped on and saw that this one had a thing, and it changed what I want to say. Because um, in information security, we work as risk identifiers in a lot of, especially blue team. You know, you're there to identify risks and close those gaps. So my mind being positive and optimistic immediately went, what happens when you lose the giants? I mean, the metaphor of the standing on the shoulders of giants is, these are the people that got me here, but what about the actual people that we rely on every day? Uh, do we figure them in? Do we think about how they help us? And do we identify them as risks, as something that could bring your company down? Not as an insider threat, but as just somebody that you've depended on. So I'm gonna go through um, three quick things, um, identifying the risks, uh, recovering from loss, and I've got recovering up there, but um, I'll get more to that. But really, what consequences you're going to deal with when it happens? Uh, because, you know, the recovery is, there's not really a recovery from it. And then mitigating the probability, which is the proactive steps there at the end. And it's, again, I'd just like to say, we all kind of know these things, but we don't talk about them, so we don't really consider them and put them into our processes every day. Um, first, a practical example. Um, so several years ago, we lost a network engineer, senior network engineer, um, a longtime employee, cornerstone of the department. Uh, very cool guy, smart, tireless, ferocious when he came to maintaining uptime. Um, about mid early 50s, he was a runner, uh, healthy, super fast. It was always fun to go to a half a thon or a 5K with him uh, just to see the other guys in his age bracket, their faces drop because. You know, they knew they were going to get pushed down position as soon as he shows up. Um, so, uh, I was in a conversation with him in the hall one day, and I was asking about his running, and he mentioned that he hadn't been able to lately because his legs were hurting. And so, it was just uh, a little bit after that, he started missing work, um, just sick, and uh, then we got an email from his manager that included the word aggressive, which is not something you want to hear. So uh, it was weeks, I mean it was no time. And he'd been pretty diligent about maintaining some of the things we're gonna talk about. So through no fault of his own, his backup, his primary backup, had just been, uh, went on to better pastures basically. It found other opportunities. And so he was kind of in a gap between replacing that talent. So that left us in an interesting spot. Learned a lot of lessons from it. Um, I'd like to say everybody on that team did a fantastic job dealing with it, but again, you learn a lot going through something like that. Um, so we'll start off with some assumptions. Um, if I say, like I said, I like regulatory guidance. So just going back to the examination handbook there, um, 
you should never assume that critical personnel, including city management, are going to be immediately available during a disruption. So if you're in a position where you're missing those key personnel and you have a DR or a BCP scenario, is that figured into the plan? Is it figured in whether they're on the road, whether they're in the hospital, whether they have to deal with their own families? Um, those kind of situations can take those people away from you and really complicate a BCP or DR scenario. So, um, humans, like I said, put up there, humans aren't highly available. I mean, it's not like we have instant replacements, and sometimes we just aren't available at all. So, looking into that as risk identifiers, we need to figure out how can we look at our organizations. I mean, we can proactively plan around this, but we can look at our organizations, we can look at our processes, and we can identify those risk factors. What you're looking for is those people in organizational trends that tend to pile up responsibilities in such a way that they can't be replaced. So I broke it into two. You've got organizational factors. So one thing, um, and we'll get back to there's uh, the causes of these and the people's responses to these, but the rate of growth of your company or your organization or your business, if you're just even adding a customer base and the volume of work's going up and not so much change, um, it doesn't leave room. I mean, uh, your day's full. You're assumed to be paid for a full day. So you're doing a full day's work. So as that volume increases, if you're not adding heads and adding, you know, stretching out the days or shifting workloads so the cross-training, documentation, uh, and planning around BCP and DR can be done, you're going to end up with more of these single point failures. The next one, I don't know if it's a good term for it, but unmanaged acquisition. So if uh, you don't have good project management um, structure in place so that when new technologies are brought in, um, or acquisitions are made, or you've got shadow IT, you know, and departments buying their own stuff. If you don't have a project manager or management team that is saying, okay, we need to assign ownership, we need to plan backup, we need to make sure our vendor management processes involve this. If you don't have all those things, a lot of stuff can sneak through. And that stuff's gonna to stick to qualified people that you need doing other things. Um, and the last one, it's, it's kind of a weird one, but, um, working with some of the people and organizations I have, high retention. So if you have a, a cultural thing in your company or the geography of it or any other factor, you have people who like to stick around. I mean, it just could be a really good place to work. Long-time employees tend to acquire additional duties. They tend to acquire a lot of institutional knowledge that makes them invaluable. So conversely, turnover is a good way to highlight weakness. If you lose somebody, you know you've got a problem. If you've got a high rate of turnover, you know what needs to be handed around because uh, you've done it so many times. So it's always a good place to look as the people that's been there a long time to inventory what they do. And we'll get back to that during mitigation. So uh, the human factor, and I was thinking through this, is, is how do we spot these people? How do we spot the people that uh, are just, like I said, they're, they're irreplaceable, they're invaluable to us. And there's really three risk factors that can add up stuff. So I went through a couple different things to call them. Uh, talk about, you know, maybe putting a superhero reference or two in here, but really nothing fits. So um, just want to say, I know all these people or combinations of these people or people that are more than one of these things. And uh, so it does come from experience, but you'll all know them as well. So uh, first I've got the golden boy. And this is pretty much a, someone who everybody likes to work with. So they've been assigned a duty over something. They're supporting something. Uh, they're the guy that they go to for this particular type of incident. Everybody gets used to working for them, working with them. So even if you assign them a backup, that backup never has to pick up the phone. Because everybody will call and say, can I get such and such? Or you know, basically, that's, they'll always email and try to circumvent anything you set up. So what happens is their secondaries never get cross-trained. And so if you lose this person, well, I mean, it's obvious. But the interesting thing about this, too, is if you promote this person, you promote this person and you're expecting them to do a new job, all that crud's going to fall along with them because the people that's been working with them all that time are still going to want to go to them. So that creates one problem. The next one is the juggernaut. So um, basically find that as everybody, most people, need sleep, food, uh, family time, you know, these kind of things. There are some people that I've worked with that don't seem to. Uh, they will work hours upon hours. Uh, they will work weekends. If they're asked to do something, they won't question it. They won't balance it out. So what problem does this create? You can't replace that person with one person. 
uh, everybody else that has expectations of work-life balance want to come in can't do that job. So, um, and you don't always know it because you just kind of you ask them to do something, they do it. It just every day. Some of them complain and do it anyway. Some of them don't complain, and you just never know. They're going to break. It might be years. It might be when they're working for you. It might be when they're working for somebody else. The problem is, is when they go away, you've got a problem. So the last one, I put the polymath. Now this is this is somebody with a broad background, especially you know talking on the technology side. So somebody's uh, put, I think, uh, if they're good at everything, just give them all the things. So if you've got a guy that knows web and programming and database and works with people and knows how to manage, well, here's a project. You want to give your pro you want to give your important things to your best guy. If, again, with the project management and control of that, if you don't really quantify what your important things are, you end up giving them all to one person. And nobody can cover for him, unless you've got two, which is unlikely. Uh, what ends up happening is, is he's got a bunch of um, different systems with different skill sets to support them. So it ends up being a lot of junior admins or sysadmins or even help desk people or you know junior analysts end up supporting them on one thing this thing or that thing. So when he goes away, you've got a whole bunch of junior admins that become primaries on something that's important to your department. And then you don't have the resources to cross train. Um, and we'll get into that some of the consequences afterwards, but they don't immediately know how to hand that off and it takes a lot of planning to recover from. So now identifying these, uh, let's see. one good way to get these things to show up, these type of risk factors to show up, it's through testing. Everybody does DR testing, I'd hope, at some, some degree, depending on which product it is. But I mean, it's the first question is when you go down the list and say, let's do our DR testing, let's look at your BCP plan. If it's only got one name on it, you, you've immediately got a problem. And it happens. And that's a, that's a simple thing. You just test fails, pick a resource, train them, retest. It's nobody's fault. We all get busy. Uh, but that right there indicates a problem. The second one, um, Again, it's just your BCP plan. You might have a secondary assigned. Everybody might be used to going to the primary. So that's one of those things, especially in incident response, as it relates to just security and as it relates to BCP and DR. When the incident occurs, do they know who the secondary is? Do they know how to contact them? Do those first responders are going to be contact center people a lot of times. Um, so they might not have that. So basically, if you start your BCP test with going to who that first responder was, and say, this has happened, what do we do about it? And they stall, easy, adjust the procedure, update the contact, retest. The last one um, is going to be more common. So you have a secondary, but they're not going to be as fast. Uh, they're not going to be as good. They might have to Google some stuff. They might have to read through the procedure. So if you've done your DR testing, your BCP testing, and you've established a recovery time objective based off that with the primary, test it again. Test it again with the secondary figure out what that time is. Now again, you can retrain them, try to make them faster. Nobody has time for that. So another important thing to remember is you can adjust those RTOs. Unless you're in a business that's so highly regulated that you have, I mean, this is one of those things, if it absolutely has to be up, if it absolutely has to be up in an hour, you're gonna to have to fix that. Um, but if it doesn't, you know, it could be that management can understand that. You can say, if such and such is available, we can get this up in an hour. If he's not, it'll take us a day. Um, it's all about setting expectations. Now, you have to give your regulators the longer time. But like I said, what you're doing is you want management to have a clear expectation of what you can accomplish with which resource. So that's all said to say it's okay to fail on these. That's how we learn, that's how we adjust and uh, identify these risks and decide on response. So, I don't really have time for questions in this talk, so I put this section in because I've talked with people about this a lot. And the first thing they pop back with is there's no time. They're giving us more stuff. We can't be cross-training to a level where we actually have good DRBCP. We can't have this kind of coverage. We can barely document our stuff. All that, that that's all fine. Um, it happens to everybody. That's what they say. So. You're not hearing you here. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Bring the mic a little closer. Right? Is that better? No. Is it off? Uh, battery. Battery's dead. All right, I'll just go a little louder. 
back up there. He <laughs> <laughs> said over there, I'll just quit what way. Yeah, yeah, Alright, he'll pop those out. I'll just, I'll just get a little louder until he gets that done. So, when the response comes back that, you know, there's a lot of frustrated technicians, a lot of, a lot of people that I talk to, um, just that the resources aren't there to accomplish that, that kind of full-time coverage, get those expectations where they want to have them. So, first thing is, is kind of calm down. It's not our responsibility, well, I say, unless there's management in this room and executive management in this room, it's not our responsibility to fix this. We identify the risk, we offer solutions, we offer mitigation you know, strategies, but at the end of the day, it's our job to locate that risk and set the management expectation about it. The staffing decisions that they make to fix or not to fix this, that's a risk decision. They, they look at these numbers and say, well, if, if, if Joe is unavailable, we're down until he comes back. If he's quit or hurt, we're down until he comes back. That's a, they can say, that's fine. Um, not having backups. Let's see if got this. Is that bad? Oh, oh, pop it right here. I'm going to overcompensate now. Um, so, like I said, not having backups, people or data, it's an option. It's not a good option. It's not something you should do, but it's one of those things. It's management's job for that. Uh, you know, not being insured, that's an option. Uh, like I said, it's at the end of the day, it's their business to burn down. You just have to set expectations. So when something, when the shoe drops, they know what to expect. Like I said, this uh, this slide here, you know, you can't you can't get dressed and parked back online without doing a sned read. Knowing those characters and seeing that movie, that's not the first time that Ray said that to John Hammond. So the look of surprise on John Hammond's face shouldn't be there because you know this has been explained before. They built that park and they had one IT guy. So, you know. It's one of those things, set the expectation. So here's where it gets bad. Um, consequences, what happens? And this, this section was originally, what do we do? Uh, what, what do we do with this? What can we do? How do we respond? And the answer is you don't really have too many choices. So if you've not planned appropriately for this, it's not so much what are you gonna do, it's here's what's gonna happen. Um, if you've lost a, a, a pillar that has a particular product knowledge or expertise, you're going to end up calling in consultants. You're going to end up calling in resellers or that company itself and bringing in a guy. Not a good solution, um, but it's what you have to do, and it's actually the better than the second one, which you've lost someone who is a kind of a cornerstone of institutional knowledge, where you've got a lot of weird systems or home-built stuff. And so now what's your choice? If there is a former employee that has left for somewhere else, you might can lure them back. Um, they're going to have a knowledge gap of the time. But it's possible, and it can be done, and they'll grow back into it. And your, a really good solution is if you've lost your giant to a consulting company, that's pretty easy because then you can pay the consulting company and give them back. You're paying, you know, three times what you were before for part-time people, but, you know, the system stayed up. Uh, third down there, acceptance. It, not everybody can do this. Uh, it depends on your business model. But maybe, maybe you were uh, building a particular application, that product no longer exists. If you don't have somebody to support it, you don't want to pay for yourself to bring somebody in that knows the tech, knows the code, um, you can always drop it. I mean, that's a cost, it's a loss, it hurts. Um, and reassigning existing resource, I put that up there because that's likely what you're gonna do, but it's not a real solution. Uh, because that person's doing a job, that person's no longer doing that job, at least in some percentage or fashion. Uh, so you're really just moving the pain points between people. So recovery step, this, this is just a real quick one. When this happens, again, it's not recovery. You're gonna do one of those four things, but what you need to do is you need to treat it like you just had an incident or a DR situation or BCP. You need to sit down and have the lessons learned, do a full inventory of what got dropped when that person gave notice or um, otherwise left. You're gonna have to educate the secondaries. If you have handed stuff off, you might have handed stuff off to junior admins that aren't familiar with the project management, aren't familiar with BCP planning, don't know that they need a backup now. And that will just, like I said, push your problems further down the road. And you need to document it as an incident. And the reason for that is, when something like this happens, there's a cost. Again, management made a decision, something happened, the business has been impacted, there's a cost associated with that. Write it up and provide it to them. That will help justify everything down the road as far as how to fix it. So, quick notes on mitigation. It really comes down to one word. Um, 
which isn't on the slide, but still, uh, you have to properly equip the backups. This is what happens. It's, you can leave out of here and say, okay, well, now we've got backups, we've got good documentation. The key is, the documentation isn't enough. You have to have job rotation. I say cross-training. Cross-training is me sit down with you, tell you what I do, you go back to your job. Does it work? If you actually want to be prepared for these type of events, you have to do job rotation. That means weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever's appropriate. Annually is not going to be appropriate for many processes. But the reason you do this is because it solves a couple of things. First off, documentation goes stale. So if you're going over it with the trainee and you're not driving and showing them, if they're having to do it, you're instantly updating your documentation because they're going to run into snags. They're going to run into systems that have been replaced. They're going to run into people that are no longer in their contact list. Um, all kinds of things. So you're constantly and continuously updating your documentation. Um, the other thing is access issues. You run into this a lot. Maybe their permissions have changed on the system. You know, what happens if you're not there and they're trying to do it and they don't have permissions even. So that it slows the entire process down and pushes out your recovery time objective. Um, in addition, they, they might be missing software. Um, there might be browser incompatibilities. Again, they might be trying to contact people that aren't there or don't know how to contact it. It might just say there might be a job role in the documentation and they don't know who that is or that role might not exist anymore. So going through it with a proper job rotation is really the only way to ensure that you actually have disaster recovery BCP capabilities as first people. So the other thing I put here is that doesn't mean that they need to 100% do everything that you can do uh, and they don't have to do it tomorrow. It can be continuous, uh, or you can continuously improve rather than trying to get it done immediately. The other thing is, is management expectations. If they expect somebody to be fully functional, was it fully, fully armed and operational, but they don't care if there's, you know, they don't care if it looks pretty. They just need it to get done in a certain amount of time. They understand that there's a difference when this one's doing it that one. As long as it does the job, it doesn't matter. Uh, but again, management expectations. So just a couple quick notes uh, in my last few minutes here. Some personal applications. And I just say this um, actually goes back to um, the, uh, the first talk. Uh, there, there are certain ways we can apply this in our life that make getting this right attractive. So first off, letting go. For ourselves and the people that we counsel, uh, it's important to think, do you want to be doing what, do you want to be that person who's absolutely irreplaceable so you don't get to sleep? You don't get to go on vacation. You don't ever get to do those things. If you think you're going to document yourself out of a job, there, there's not enough of us for that. It's not going to happen. So that's just a quick picture. Uh, that's the when I came out of infrastructure and was able to train my replacement and move fully into information security, I was able to take the first two-week vacation of my life without ever logging in. So that's that's actually in Maine. Uh, so we crawled up along all the little coastal towns in New England for two solid weeks. Uh, I checked email. That's it. Never logged in, never touched the VPN. So does that mean the company don't need me? No, it just means everything could either wait or somebody else knew how to do it. And so if I was actually taken down by something, same result would be. But it's good for me. Um, it was good for me. It's good to get that work-life balance. Makes you a better employee. And the second thing, which goes back to what she said at the start, you want to advance the profession, again, for your own benefit. If you can't find people to train, if they don't have the skills to cover for you, if you don't trust them, if you're the golden boy to yourself, and you don't trust anybody else to do your job, that's a problem. You'll end up in the same boat. So what you do is, is we sell for us as information security, but you, you recruit these people. You tell people, have you tried this? Would you like to do this? Do you think you'd be good at this? And like I said, you mentor. And once you do that, uh, like I said, you've got people who can replace you. Now that's the thing. You might be in a job where you don't want to be replaced. But do this anyway, because again, it's competent service to your employer because something might happen to you outside your control. But the other thing is, you're helping this person. You might train them to be your replacement. They might never replace you. But now they have opportunities and skills that will further their career and allow them to pivot to other things that they might enjoy doing. So, so like I said, back to the title, um, I was a man. One of my favorite poems, uh, Brian Cran I ain't going to go through all that, but Brian Cranston does a great reading of it on YouTube for one of the uh, seasons of Breaking Bad. Find it, it's good. Uh, but basically, it boils down uh, to just the point that it doesn't matter what systems you build, it doesn't matter what you write down about them, um, all of that 
means nothing unless you have people that can carry it on after you. If you don't pay attention to the people, it's just, it's, it's all going to fall into ruin. None of, nothing, none of this runs forever. So, that is the end. Uh, appreciate the time. I think I'm right on.